Thank you for your word and for giving us ultimate freedom from sin and death through the work of Jesus Christ. Thank you for graciously giving us your Holy Spirit to live in us, to guide us, and help us to put to death our old sinful nature through the power of the Spirit. Please encourage us through your word today and soften our hearts as we submit to the leading of your Holy Spirit daily. Thank you for your faithful servant, Peter, and please equip him today to speak in boldness and in truth. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen. Romans chapter 8, uh, please read with me from verse 1. Therefore, there is now no condemnation for those who are in Christ Jesus, because through Christ Jesus, the law of the spirit of life set me free from the law of sin and death. For what the law was powerless to do in that it was weakened by the sinful nature, God did by sending his own son in the likeness of sinful man to be a sin offering. And so he condemned sin in sinful man in order that the righteous requirements of the law might be fully met in us who do not live according to the sinful nature, but according to the spirit. Those who live according to the sinful nature have their minds set on what that nature desires. But those who live in accordance with the spirit have their minds set on what the spirit desires. The mind of sinful man is death, but the mind controlled by the spirit is life and peace. The sinful mind is hostile to God. It does not submit to God's law, nor can it do so. Those controlled by the sinful nature cannot please God. You, however, are controlled not by the sinful nature, but by the spirit, if the spirit of God lives in you. And if anyone does not have the spirit of Christ, he does not belong to Christ. But if Christ is in you, your body is dead because of sin, yet your spirit is alive because of righteousness. And if the spirit of him who raised Jesus from the dead is living in you, he who raised Christ from the dead will also give life to your mortal bodies through his spirit who lives in you. Therefore, brothers, we have an obligation, but it is not to the sinful nature to live according to it. For if you live according to the sinful nature, you will die. But if by the spirit you put to death the misdeeds of the body, you will live because those who are led by the Spirit of God are sons of God. For you did not receive a spirit that makes you a slave again to fear, but you received the spirit of sonship, and by him we cry, Abba, Father. The Spirit himself testifies with our spirit that we are God's children. Now if we are children, then we are heirs, heirs of God and co-heirs with Christ, if indeed we share in his sufferings, in order that we may also share in his glory. This is the word of our Lord. Thanks, Is. Good morning, church. Good morning. So I hope you had a good time chatting about your superpower. Uh, so my name is Peter, I'm a ministry apprentice here, and my superpower is that I just don't put on weight. Uh, I can eat as much as I want, I can eat whatever I want, and I just don't put on weight. Uh, actually, in fact, if I stop exercising, I actually lose muscle mass and I lose weight when I stop exercising. So friends, we all want power of some sort, don't we? even if we don't admit it. And I'm not talking about some quirky personal trait or attribute, uh, but I'm talking about real power. The power to uh, change our lives, the power to protect those that we love, uh, the power to solve all our problems. But God doesn't actually promise us that kind of power. But he does promise us one power uh, that we all have if we have trusted in Jesus as our saviour. And that is the power of the Holy Spirit within us to fight against sin. Uh, so that's what we'll be looking at today from Romans chapter 8. Uh, before we begin, let me just give you today's big idea, the main idea for today, so that you can keep the big picture in mind as we go through the details of the passage. And so it's this, that God's Spirit lives in you so that you would live and sin would die. Let me read that again. Uh, God's spirit lives in you so that you would live and sin would die. Uh, so please have your Bibles open to Romans chapter 8 uh, and follow along with me. 
In Romans chapter 8, Paul begins uh, by talking about the foundation of having God's Spirit. That is, we first need to be set freed from sin to live by the Spirit. And so this section flows on from chapter 7, uh, where Paul last week was talking about you know, the frustrating and futile and human experience of struggling against sin. Uh, verse 24 in chapter 7, uh, he says, What a wretched man I am! You know, who will rescue me from this body that is subject to death? But thankfully, there is a solution. By the time we get to verse 25, he says, Thanks be to God who delivers me through Jesus Christ our Lord. And so here, at the start of chapter, chapter 8, he's continuing on from that. And he's saying, if Christ has delivered sinners, then verse 1, therefore, there is now no condemnation for those who are in Christ Jesus. The verdict for those who are in Christ Jesus is now not guilty, innocent, right with God. Why is that? Verse 2, because through Christ Jesus, the law of the Spirit who gives life has set you free from the law of sin and death. Now, the law of the Spirit and the law of sin here uh, isn't referring to the Old Testament law, but rather it's talking about authority. Uh, so that Christians are now no longer under the authority of sin, but under the authority of the Spirit. And how has this made, been made possible? Look at verse 3. For what the law was powerless to do, because it was weakened by the flesh, God did. By sending his own son in the likeness of sinful flesh to be a sin offering. And so he condemned sin in the flesh. So now, in verse 3, Paul is talking about the Old Testament law. God's law, his perfect standards are good, but because we're weak, they only serve to highlight our weakness. Uh, if you think back to last week, remember how Felix talked about scales, and we step on them and they just reveal our reality. But they're powerless to change us. And so that's why God sent Jesus to be an offering for sin. Because Jesus was condemned uh, in our place, there is now no condemnation for those who are in him. Uh, in other words, uh, every last drop of condemnation was taken by Jesus in our place. And then in verse 4, you know, why did God do that? He did that in order that the righteous requirement of the law might be fully met in us, who do not live according to the flesh, but according to the Spirit. And so Jesus died for us so that God's requirements can now be met in us. Not because of our obedience, but because of Jesus' perfect obedience. Um, so a few weeks ago, I was trying to teach this to my Sunday school boys. Uh, and so I bring out uh, these report cards from God. And I ask them to rate themselves, to assess themselves on, on a few uh, godly areas, like obeying your parents, you know, being generous, being, uh, uh, being humble, and so on. And uh, so the boys are like, yeah, you know, we do, we do pretty well. You know, I give myself an A and a B. Uh, but then I explain to them, yeah, because God is perfect and we're not perfect. Even our best efforts only result in a fail. And then I bring out uh, a Jesus report card and Jesus has straight A pluses. But then I tell them, guys, here's the thing. When Jesus died for you on the cross, he takes your failed report card and makes that his. And he gives you his perfect report card and that becomes yours. And so Jesus takes the consequences of your failure and gives you the reward for his perfect obedience. And when I tell them that, I can just see their, their brains kind of churning and they all go silent and they're listening really carefully. And then finally one of them says, that's not fair, how is that fair? Yes, it's not fair, but Jesus loves you, and that is what he has done for you. So, brothers and sisters, do you know this simple and yet profound truth? That there is now, right now, there is no condemnation for you if you have trusted in Jesus. As you look back on your life or 
Uh, as you look at your life now, you know, are there things that you haven't done or things that you have done that you keep beating yourself up over? You might be thinking things like, you know, why didn't I spend more time with the kids? You know, why do I keep losing my temper at them? You know, why did I ever say that to my friend? You know, oh, I should have never gotten angry at my parents. Why do I feel so envious, angry, selfish all the time? You know, what's wrong with me? Am I even a Christian? Now, friends, are you condemning yourself where God does not? You know, God is saying here, right now, right now, there is no condemnation. You know, you, not after you fixed your problem, uh, not even wait until you get to heaven, but right now, there is no condemnation if you're in Christ. When we get to heaven, God's not going to say, you know, oh, Peter, you know, you know this thing that you did in 2020, you know, I haven't forgiven you for that yet. You, know, you, you better do something to fix it. No, he's not going to say that because right now, there is no condemnation. Jesus has already paid for every mistake, every wrong that we've ever done. So don't condemn yourself where God doesn't. So what does that mean? How must we respond to that? Verse 4. Live according to the Spirit. So Christ's death for us is the foundation of living for the Spirit. We're freed from sin to live by the Spirit. And in the rest of the passage today, uh, we'll see four things about what that means. It means that the Spirit gives us a new mind, a new life, a new obligation, and a new identity. Firstly, living by the Spirit means to have a new mind. <clears throat> so let's read from verse 5. Those who live according to the flesh have their minds set on what the, spirit, on what the flesh desires. But those who live in accordance with the Spirit have their minds set on what the Spirit desires. The mind governed by the flesh is death, but the mind governed by the Spirit is life and peace. The mind governed by the flesh is hostile to God. It does not submit to God's law, nor can it do so. Those who are in the realm of the flesh cannot please God. And so here, Paul is showing us two completely different ways of living. Living according to flesh means to have minds that are set on what the flesh desires. It means death. It means being hostile to God, not submitting to God's law. And those who are in the realm of the flesh cannot even please God, even if they wanted to. By contrast, uh, living according to the Spirit means to have minds that are set on what the Spirit desires and to have life and peace. And so there are two completely different ways of living. Uh, now Paul talks a lot about our minds here. And so we have to note that uh, minds here is not just about uh, knowing a bunch of facts in our heads, but rather it's actually a, a direction of our wills. It's our, our reason, our understanding, our affections, our self-talk, our decision-making, our entire worldview. Our entire worldview. And so to live by the Spirit is to have new minds that are governed and submit to the Spirit. In verse 8, Paul also says that those who are in the realm of the flesh cannot please God. So we need God's Spirit to bring us into a new realm altogether. The realm of the Spirit. And so, when, he, and so the, when that happens, you know, it's no longer about just coming to church a few hours a week. It's about having our entire mindset shifted, our entire realm of living to be now within the Spirit, to be governed by the Spirit. Uh, a, few, a few weeks ago, I was at North Stradbroke Island with some friends, and we were doing the North Gorge Boardwalk. And there's a section where you can walk out onto these beautiful rocky cliffs and uh, to have these panoramic views of the ocean. And you know, everyone's enjoying themselves, but I'm actually really freaked out, because you know, the other people, they're, they're walking as close to the edge as possible, and you know, trying to take a look down, and they're trying to you know, get the best photo possible, and they're right at the edge. And I'm really freaked out, because you know, all it would take is if they tripped, or, or if a strong gust of wind blew them, and they would fire, fall right over the edge. So friends, I think sometimes we can actually live a little bit like that. 
Uh, We know what is sinful, and we know what the Spirit wants for us. But then sometimes we think it's, you know, it's fun to totter along the edge and see how close we can get without actually falling in. And I think we, we do that when we ask questions like, uh, you know, what, what can I get with, what, what can I get away with watching on Netflix before it's unhelpful for me? You know, or, or how much can I spend on, on this car or how much can I spend on my stuff before it's too much? Uh, you know, or how physically, physically close can I get to my uh, girlfriend or boyfriend before it's not honoring to God? And when we ask questions like that, uh, our minds are set on what the flesh desires, not what the spirit desires, and we're walking dangerously close to the edge. Instead, to live uh, by the spirit means that, means that if sin is over here, then we're going in this direction. You know, we're, we're running in a totally different direction. We have a new goal. We have a new mindset about life now. We want to get as far as possible away from sin to do what God desires. And we want to do that because we're in a whole new realm now. You know, everything's changed for us. So firstly, to have God's spirit living in you is to have a completely new mind set on what the spirit desires, not what the flesh desires. Secondly, God's spirit gives us a new life. So follow along from verse 9. You, however, are not in the realm of the flesh, but in the realm of the spirit. If indeed the spirit of God lives in you, and if anyone does not have the spirit of Christ, they do not belong to Christ. But if Christ is in you, then even though your body is subject to death because of sin, the Spirit gives life because of righteousness. And if the Spirit of him who raised Jesus from the dead is living in you, he who raised Christ from the dead will also give life to your mortal bodies because of his Spirit who lives in you. So after contrasting the flesh and the Spirit, uh, Paul now turns to the Roman Christians who he's writing to. And he says, you, you Christians are no longer in the realm of the flesh, but you're in the realm of the spirit. In other words, uh, you, you've jumped ship. You've changed teams. You have a new captain now. You're in a different realm now altogether. And then you'll notice that he uses four ifs to draw out some logical conclusions. He says, uh, verse 9, if the spirit of God lives in you, then you're in the realm of the spirit. Verse 9 again, if anyone does not have the spirit of Christ, then they do not belong to Christ. Verse 10, if Christ is in you, then the spirit will give you life. And verse 11, if the spirit is in you, then God will give you life. So so what is Paul's point here? I think his point is this, that if you belong to Christ, the spirit lives in you. And if the spirit lives in you, then God will give you life. There is an unbreakable chain between these things. If you have trusted in Jesus and belong to him, then God's spirit is living in you, friends. And this is not only true for some mature Christians or special Christians, but it's true for every Christian. The moment you receive Christ into your heart and acknowledge him as your savior is the moment that the creator of the universe His spirit comes to live in you. So what does that mean for our life now? This means that even though our bodies might feel mortal and weak and subject to death, God's spirit is in you and he will rescue you from sin until the day you have eternal life. So yes, in this life, we will still fail and sin. And sometimes it seems like Uh, Maybe our sinful nature is stronger than the Holy Spirit within us. And and then we, you know, kick ourselves and we think, you know, what's wrong with me? Why Why do I keep struggling against sin? You know, why isn't God's Spirit doing His work in me? But brothers and sisters, have hope. Sin is not going to win. Not a chance in the world. Because God's Spirit is living in you. At the end of the day, God's Spirit will overcome sin, and God's Spirit will give you eternal life with God. So hold on to your future hope and keep fighting sin today.
God's Spirit will give you a new life. Thirdly, uh, we have a new obligation. Follow along from verse 12. Therefore, brothers and sisters, we have an obligation, but it is not according, but it is not to the flesh to live according to it. For if you live according to the flesh, you will die. But if you live by the Spirit, you put to death the misdeeds of the body. You will live. You will live. So here Paul uh, says that we have an obligation. Now I know uh, when we talk about our Christian duty, often we talk, talk in terms of you know, a joyful response to God's love you know, or, or a free will choice to uh, respond to him and obey him. And so calling it an obligation isn't that a bit um, dry or legalistic? But I think uh, here is the objective reality uh, that Paul is talking about. Once we were under the authority of sin and death, but now God has set us free in Christ and brought us under the authority of the Spirit. I think it's a bit like this. Um, so imagine that you're a refugee, maybe, uh, and so. Uh, you're living in a war-torn country with no food and shelter, you know, no, no education, no future. But one day, you're rescued and brought into a safe and spacious and beautiful country. And when you arrive, they tell you about the laws of the new country. And how do you respond to that? You, know, you, you can't say, uh, you know, oh yeah, you know, I like it here and it's nice here, but I don't want to follow your laws. Uh, I'll be right. You can't say that, can you? because you have an obligation to follow those laws. So yes, you might do it out of gratitude uh, and thankfulness because of the kindness that you've been shown, but it's more than that, isn't it? It's actually an obligation to live under the authority of your new country. So in the same way, you know, God has set us free from sin and death and brought us into his kingdom. And so, we have, so we're in a new realm with a new king, and so we have an obligation to follow that king. And then in verse 13, we see that keeping that obligation is a matter of life and death. Paul says, if you live according to the flesh, uh, in other words, if sin lives, then you will die. But if by the Spirit you put to death the misdeeds of the body, in other words, if sin dies, then you live. And so in a really concise way, Paul is saying, sin lives, you die. Sin dies, you live. So we see here that we have an obligation to live by the Spirit, uh, which means putting death, to, putting death sin by the power of the Spirit. Hmm. Lastly, living by the Spirit means we have a new identity. Verse 14, for those who are led by the Spirit of God are the children of God. The Spirit you received does not make you slaves, so that you live in fear again. Rather, the Spirit you received brought about your adoption to sonship, and by Him we cry, Abba, Father. The Spirit Himself testifies with our spirit that we are God's children. Now, if we are children, then we are heirs. Heirs of God and co-heirs with Christ, if indeed we share in his sufferings, in order that we may also share in his glory. In this final section, Paul starts by talking about uh, being led by the Spirit. Now, we don't have time today to talk about uh, comprehensively how the Spirit leads, but here it's clear uh, from the context that it's not, some, that it's not an objective, a mysterious, or a subjective kind of leading. Why is that? Because Paul has already talked about uh, what it means to live according to the Spirit in the previous sections. So how does the Spirit lead here? The Spirit leads Christians to have a mindset to desire what the Spirit desires. The Spirit leads Christians to have a new everlasting life. The Spirit leads Christians to fulfill their obligation to put sin to death. And so being led uh, by the Spirit here simply means trusting in the Spirit, saying yes to the Spirit to do those things. It means to have the, the direction of our lives 
are controlled by, determined by, governed by the Spirit. And this is not a mysterious experience at all. This is something that every child of God can do. Next in verse 15, the Spirit gives Christians a new identity as God's daughters and sons. And so Abba here is the Aramaic term that Jesus uses personally to call God the Father. And so Paul is saying amazingly here that Christians can talk to God in the same way that Jesus does. And that our relationship with God is very much like Jesus's. To illustrate that point, you know, Paul now contrasts slaves with children. So what sets apart a child from a slave? Let's have a think about that. So slaves are uh, temporary. Slaves are sackable if they do a bad job. Uh, slaves are replaceable. You just get another one. Uh, and the value is based on their performance, right? But if you're a Christian, then you are not a slave. You are a beloved child of God. And so do we know that? Do we live like that? A child is uh, forever. You know, once you are a child of God, you will always be a child of God. Nothing can change that reality. A child will never be sacked, right? And so when you fail and you sin, God is not going to sack you and kick you out of his family. A child is irreplaceable. God has a unique relationship with you personally. He cares for you personally. And a child is unconditionally loved. It doesn't matter how you perform, God accepts you regardless. And so, uh, friends, my fear is that too many of us might be living like slaves of God rather than children of God. Uh, or maybe like employees, if that's a bit easier to, to relate to. You know, we, we rush around uh, meeting our Christian KPIs, going to life group, reading our Bibles, praying, doing all that stuff, doing our best not to, not to get fired by God. And when we mess up, we might feel a bit further away from God until we can do a better job or, or fix the problem, and then we come back to him. Um, but that's not what Paul talks about here. Having God uh, as our dad, our father, means coming to him, crying out to him, no matter how we feel, no matter how we're performing. And so, friends, uh, speak to him this week. You know, say, Dad, good morning. Please be with me today. Dad, help me with this client. Dad, I feel so sad right now, and I don't even know why. Dad, Help me to speak with him. Dad, help me to speak with her. Dad, thanks. I love being your child. Thanks for being my father. So come to God as your father and cry out to him as your father. As we continue, verse 16, uh, the Spirit himself testifies with our spirit. So not only does the Spirit make us God's children, God's Spirit works with our spirit to help us to know and to reassure us that we are indeed His children. And so in our innermost parts of our being, uh, the Spirit helps us to hold on to that fact that we are sons and daughters of God. <coughs> Verse 17, uh, not only that, but we are heirs and co-heirs with Christ. Being heirs of God means that we inherit all God's promises to His people. But it can also mean that we inherit God himself, and he is our greatest inheritance. And the fact that we're co-heirs uh, reminds us that it's all through Jesus. Jesus is the heir, he is the son. But it also shows that God hasn't held anything back from us. It's not like Jesus inherits God's blessings and then we just get some scraps and some leftovers. No, we're, we're fellow heirs with Christ, the way God raised Jesus from death to life and into his, brought him into his presence, that's exactly what God will do for us as well because we're co-heirs with Christ. And then finally, uh, there is just one condition uh, to receive these amazing blessings, and that is that we must suffer with Christ. And so I won't talk too much about that today, because this, this really launches into the second half of Romans 8 that Pastor Iggy will be talking about. 
So in this fourth section, uh, we see that God's Spirit gives us a new identity as His sons and daughters. So as we come to the end of today's passage, uh, let me just recap what we've seen today. Paul begins by talking about how we are freed from sin to live by the Spirit. And then what does that mean? It means that the Spirit gives us a new mind, a new life, a new obligation, and a new identity. And so what are we meant to do with all that? What are we meant to do? I think in one sense, uh, Paul's call to Christians here is quite simple. It's simply to live by the Spirit, isn't it? To live by the Spirit. If the Spirit has given us a new mind, then we can completely shift our worldviews to be in the Spirit, to desire what the Spirit desires, not what the flesh desires. So are you, you know, are you tottering on the edge of sin? If you're doing that, don't. Stop doing that. Um, run away from sin as far as you can in the opposite direction because God's Spirit brings you into a new realm. If the Spirit has given us a new life, then don't be discouraged in your fight against sin. I know it's hard, uh, but keep looking forward to, to the day where there will be no more sin and no more suffering. You are promised a new life, and God's Spirit will keep you safe until then. So keep on going. Now, if the Spirit has given us a new obligation, then we're in a new kingdom now, a new realm with a new king to follow. So keep following your King Jesus and putting sin to death in your life. And finally, if the Spirit has given us a new identity, then let's live out our new identity as God's sons and God's daughters. Let's stop performing to earn God's acceptance, stop, rel stop relying on our own efforts, and just relax. Just be in God's presence. Talk to Him as your loving Heavenly Father. So to finish today, um, I want you to, to just take home uh, one thing, okay? So if you don't remember anything else from today, I want you to remember this. God's Spirit lives in you. If you have trusted in Jesus, God's Spirit, the Spirit of the Almighty Creator of the universe, lives in you. And I want you to hold on to this because I know in our struggle against sin, maybe, maybe you've tried everything. You know, maybe you're sharing with your brothers and sisters, you're getting that accountability, you know, you're doing your best to read the Bible, to pray, uh, you're reading books about the topic, maybe you're even seeking professional help. And all those things are great and they're good, but don't forget that God's Spirit lives in you. He is powerful and He will make a difference. And yes, it will be a day-by-day, step-by-step process. It's not going to be perfect. It's not going to be easy. But God has already saved you, and he will continue to change you through his spirit until the day you are with him in heaven. So let's pray to our Heavenly Father now. Would you pray, would you pray with me? Father God, uh, Lord, thank you, firstly, for Jesus. Thank you so much for sending your son to die for sinners like us. Thank you for sending your spirit to be living within us. Father, we're sorry when uh, we don't realize that or we don't live according to the spirit, but we ask now that this week you would make your presence within us known deeply. Would your spirit testify with our innermost being to reassure us and to Give us strength in the face of sin. Father, we ask that as your children and in the name of Jesus Christ, our Lord. Amen.